Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Pastor Donald. I want to welcome you to the Montville United Methodist Church, a loving, inclusive, integrity-filled, and supportive church that offers hope and purpose to all people. Whether you're here with us in the sanctuary, whether you're with us on Zoom, or watching this later on YouTube at a later time, we are glad you are with us. And you know, one of my favorite seasons is autumn, is the fall, and I don't know about you, but things are starting to shift, things are starting to change, but as I'm reminded, every season this time rolls around, I don't want to miss the beautiful changes around me. And you know, I wonder in our own personal lives, in our faith, in our church, you know, what are the changes that are happening, the colors that are giving way to a new season, and are we mindful of them? Are we mindful of the changes around us? Or are we missing out on the beauty such that the trees are barren and before we even know it, we missed out on the color changes. And so I invite you to think about, you know, as we kind of finalize our sermon series on the hungry to whole, as we think about what a healthy church looks like, I invite you to pay attention to look for the changes around you, to look for the signs of God so that we might not miss out on anything God has in store. But I know God has a lot in store for us each and every time we step into worship that God can do the amazing and the unthinkable, the impossible even. But as we join together in worship, we want to invite you to join us first in the song, Just to Closer Walk with Thee, and then I'm going to live so God can use me. We'll be in the Black Faith We Sing hymnal. We'll start with hymn number 2158 and then 2153. Let's join in song together. Thank you.
Amen. You may be seated. And friends, I think I'm going to use this mic for today. Just wanted to test that out. Uh, but welcome. We're glad you're here once again. And uh, one uh, special announcement we wanted to make, as you know, uh, last Sunday was a hard Sunday. We uh, celebrated Joe and Lori after being with us, believe it or not, 33 years in this church, 20 years with Joe as music minister, uh, 16, 18 years with Lori as deacon. And so uh, we invite you to continue praying for them. Reach out if you'd like. If you'd like some one-on-one, -on -one, they're still around. Uh, but we are going to be inviting guest musicians for the next several months uh, until we uh, have the chance to go through an interview process more thoroughly uh, and select a candidate to bring on whoever God is calling next. And so for this first Sunday uh, that we uh, have now said goodbye to Joe and Lori, we're welcoming some new faces in. And so Eamon Dingle is going to be our uh, worship leader for today and also on the 24th. And so uh, we invite you, each and every guest who comes, uh, welcome them in. Uh, just as you would anyone who's part of your family or our church family. Uh, we're grateful for his gifts of music and for his presence here today. And, amen. And each week we have a prayer list that's contained in your bulletin, and we invite you, as always, if you have a prayer concern, something you want to lift up or have us be praying throughout the weeks ahead, uh, please fill that out. It's something you can drop off in the offering on your way out. Um, but also contained in your bulletin is a truck or treat flyer. And perhaps you already have one of these at home. Perhaps you've already filled out a uh, truck or treat decorating your car invitation. Uh, but if you have already, we invite you to even use this as an outreach and make sure that you take this home and find one person. It could be a neighbor, a coworker, someone to speak about this event because we are excited. We hope you are excited too for what this outreach event can be and what we can do together through it. And so it'll be the first time we're doing a trunk or treat, uh, but we're looking for more and more cars especially. So if you are interested in getting creative, decorating your car, uh, we invite you to fill out uh, the form on the back of this or some of the bigger forms out on the table back there. And then after that, a couple weeks after on November 13th from 10 to 3, we'll be having an open house a craft sale, a bake, a bake sale, so we invite you to a craft fair, bake sale, so we invite you to come, let Debbie know if you want to be a part of that, um, and then for the trunk or treat, of course, you can call Susie um, as expressed on the flyer there. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we did want to let you know we got word from Kim uh, about the coming Fifth Friday, each Fifth Friday we help to provide a meal to those in need through Nourish New Jersey over in Morristown. Um, and I know last time we did 100 bags, 50 from us, 50 from Butler. And so they're seeing the need to be about 150 this time. So we're going to be trying to do 75 and 75. Uh, Kim says if we can't do a certain amount, we can always have Butler do a little bit more. But um, I do believe we can get there. And we're going to invite you on the 24th in a similar way we did last time. Uh, stay after service. We're going to have a meal packing event. And so we hope you will join us for that. And we're not asking to buy food, but if you'd like to donate to the cause to give money uh, to help cover the cost of the food that will be buy, that will be bought by whoever it is that's designated to do that, um, we invite you to just give a, a donation that says, um, it could be Soup Kitchen, Nourish New Jersey, uh, whatever it is on that memo line of your check. Um, but we do have a little bit of money, I believe, from the last time that will kind of roll over into this time. Uh, we thank you in advance for your generosity and participation there. Um, and aside from that, we have one more week of Hungry to Whole. That'll be this Wednesday. We are doing that from 6.30 to 8 p.m. It'll be potluck style. And we encourage you, if you haven't been yet, this is a great opportunity to come. And then we'll take a couple weeks break and start back in November. Uh, and then, as you'll note at the very end of the bulletin, there's a, a special note. Uh, there's about three different pastoral emergency contacts. Um, so I'll be here through Thursday. Friday will be the first day I'll be away for about two weeks. Uh, but those are all the contacts. Should there be a pastoral emergency, you can reach out to. And so uh, if anything you want to talk for, uh, converse about it, and I'll be here for the next uh, you know, four or five days. But uh, Friday will be that first day I'll be taking off. Uh, and friends, we invite you to join us responsibly in our call to worship today. But please join me in the bold as printed in your bulletin or as on the screen. 
lead a life worthy of the calling to which you are called. We cannot do this alone. We dare not try this alone. So we gather as God's people. Lead a life worthy of your calling, a life filled with service and meekness. We come to build up Christ's body in humility and gentleness, with patience and love. Lead a life which reflects your calling, that life, that life of peace grounded in the Spirit. We rejoice in our oneness in Christ, sharing the grace offered to us. May we continue growing in our faith and live lives worthy of the calling we have received. Amen. Friends, we invite you now to pull out your blue hymnal. We'll be singing the song, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. It's hymn number 402 in your blue hymnal. We invite you to join us in worship and to stand as you're able. of Christ our Savior. Uh, but this time, Rita and Cross, if you want to come up, we've got a special children's time message just for you guys. But good morning. It's good to see you today. Thank you. And you know, I love the shirt, Adventure Awaits. You've got stars on your shirt, right? The star, sky is the limit. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about vegetables, and I know you may not think adventure awaits in vegetables, that there's something worth paying attention to like the stars, but this is the last week we're talking about the tales of veggies. And so we've talked about onions and broccoli and carrots and tomatoes, if they're even a vegetable, and now we're getting to celery. And I want, do you guys like celery? Uh, I would taste it like once, mm -hmm. only in my soup. Only in your soup. So it's really good in soup, and I really like it in peanut butter. That's a great way to eat celery for me. Remember when we were young, we used to make recipes. Yeah. And, you know, I think sometimes people need that extra thing on it or need to put it in soup because it doesn't have much flavor, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty bland, and, and a big part of that is because it doesn't have any calories, and they sit really, if you eat celery, you're actually burning calories. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a vegetable that, you know, not only is healthy for you, but helps you to burn calories without even running. Can you believe that? Or doing any physical activity? But 
Celery, believe it or not, would you believe that it can reach a height of 3.3 feet? I don't know how tall you guys are, but it can get pretty high up you, right? And so celery can grow as tall as 3.3 feet. And believe it or not, it used to be considered a medicinal herb instead of a vegetable. There was a time where it was only considered something that heals, not something that is a vegetable. Because it was used to treat toothaches, insomnia, so when we can't sleep really well, anxiety, arthritis, when our bones are hurting, right, when our joints are hurting, and also to purify our blood. And so celery was just thought to be this medicinal herb way back when, from about the 1600s onward. And it was even sometimes used as a bouquet of flowers to reward winners, athletes who would compete and do well in their competition. And so, you know, I don't know about you, but kind of like celery was initially thought to be, we're, we're called to be healing agents in the world, right? To help people be relieved of their toothaches and arthritis and, you know, the things that hurt them in a figurative way, right? Because Jesus is our healer, right? But we're also called to be God's healing hands to the world. And, you know, I, I bet if we add some celery to soup or add something to flavor it, we can make it desirable by all people around us. So even if it's not a go-to vegetable for many, I believe we can treat it in such a way and present it in such a way that people will love and want celery and perhaps even be healed, be strengthened as a result. And so next time you eat celery, I know you've only had it maybe once, but I hope you can remember maybe this lesson and think about even Jesus, our healer, just like the history of celery was really a healing thing and that Jesus can heal anything going on and that even with Jesus, right, adventure awaits. The sky is the limit, the stars around us, but may you turn to Christ to know that and experience that as you help to be a healing hand in the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. But thanks for joining us for children's time. So you all can go back, and I know that adventure awaits you uh, perhaps in another way that you didn't expect. But friends, sometimes we are not the healing agents we desire to be. Sometimes, unlike celery, we are things that make things uh, in pain or hurt. And sometimes the sin in our own lives just makes us agonize. And even the sin we see in the world. And so we, we come to a time of confession uh, where we acknowledge some of those things. Uh, but also that we're mindful of God's grace that stands even now. Uh, we invite you to pray with me. Um, as we hear a prayer of confession, very reminiscent of the passage we'll be hearing for today's sermon. But let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the amazing generosity to us. You pour out your gifts on your people for the building up of your church and for the redemption of the world. We confess to you that many of the gifts you have given us remain unopened. We are scared to touch them. We have not unwrapped them. We are afraid of what the gift may become in us and what you will ask of us. Help us, O oh Lord, to unwrap and use that which you've given for the building up of your kingdom. Friends, God gives us the gifts and the grace we need to carry out God's work Become more like Jesus. The Spirit activates these gifts in each of us, building us up in the church along with it, as we also rest in and proclaim the gospel message of love and forgiveness wherever we're called. Amen. And even at this time, if you want, you're invited to go to the pews and we'll invite you back up toward the end of the sermon. But friends, our passage for today comes from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 7 followed by verses 11 through 16. Uh, listen now for God's word to us. These are words from Paul to the church of Ephesus. 
I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord God, we are hungry, hungry for more of you, hungry for a fresh encounter with your spirit. So come, Holy Spirit, make us whole and fill us to the full, we pray. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. When you imagine what the perfect pastor is like, what comes to mind? Well, in the Rochester Courier Journal, there was an article published in September of 1981 titled, The Perfect Pastor. And here's what the article had to say about what the perfect pastor is like. The perfect pastor preaches exactly 10 minutes he condemns his sin roundly, but he never hurts anyone's feelings. He works from 8 a.m. until midnight and is also the church's janitor. <laughs> the perfect pastor makes $40 a week, wears good clothes, drives a good car, buys good books, and donates $30 a week to the church. <laughs> the perfect pastor is 29 years old and has 40 years of experience. Above all, he is handsome. The perfect pastor has a burning desire to work with teenagers, and he spends most of his time with senior citizens. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his church. He makes 15 home visits a day and is always in his office to be handy when needed. The perfect pastor always has time for church council and all its committees. He never misses the meeting of any church organization and is also always busy evangelizing the unchurched. The perfect pastor is always the next church over. <laughs> Friends, I have a confession to make. I am not the perfect pastor. And the perfect pastor is not at the Methodist church over because I serve there too. And even if you went beyond that one, I guarantee you the perfect pastor would not be found. He or she would be imperfect. But all that being said, when you picture the perfect church, what comes to mind now? Well, I don't have a funny article to speak to what the perfect church looks like, but perhaps you can write an article for us someday and make sure it has impossibly unattainable standards within it. <laughs> But even with that non-existent article, I have a, another reality to express to you. We are not the perfect church. Mainly because you and I are part of it. 
Just as there is no perfect pastor, there is no perfect church because it is made up of imperfect people. And this is not a bad thing, this is just the reality. And it's a reality we ought to remember as we continue doing ministry to keep us humble, to keep things in perspective, and also to keep our attention focused on the one who is perfect, God. Lance Lambert once said, everyone is searching for the perfect church, but the reality is there is no such thing as the perfect church. And Charles Spurgeon once said, imperfect though the church is, it is the dearest place to us on earth. Because it, is it not true we love it in spite of its imperfections? Like a family, sometimes there's conflict, sometimes there's issues that we deal with, but in its imperfection, in its brokenness, just like many things in this world, we, we love it for what it is. And we love it because it is the primary means through which Christ's gospel message and the kingdom goes forth. It's the place where we are primarily nurtured and fed so that we can go out and be God's hands and feet in the world. But you know, even if we can't be perfect, you know what we can be? We can be healthy. We can be a healthy church. Though we might not be able to reach perfection, even if we strive toward it as John Wesley called us to, there is such a thing as a healthy disciple, there is such a thing as a healthy church. And so we can have the signs of life, we can have signs of vitality in our faith, in our church, and all the systems that work together to make the body of Christ whole. And you know, we've been talking the past several weeks about this movement from hungry to whole, whether it's in our physical health, our mental health, our spiritual health, our relational health, or even in the world. And we desire wholeness, but what does it look like to be made whole, to have health in all these different aspects of our lives? And then what about in the church? What does a healthy church look like? Well, I believe that a healthy church is one that is actually marked by some of what Paul is describing here in Ephesians 4. If you read chapters 1 through 3 before, Paul is first describing what God's done for believers in Christ. And then from that point, launches into his written, what's written here in chapter 4. And so in response to God's grace, in response to God's love, and the calling on our lives... Paul encourages us to live lives that are transformed, that honor God, lives that reflect what a healthy disciple and what a healthy church can look like. And so let's, let's go through some of them, right? Let's point out some of these descriptions Paul gives. He says, a healthy church is one where, as verse 3 says, we make the effort to maintain the unity of spirit with the bond of peace. Are we divided? Are we at war with one another regarding anything? If so, we have work to do. A healthy church is also one that, as verse 15 says, speaks the truth in love. You know, we're called to be a, a church that loves people, but also one that loves people enough not to leave them where they're at. And even hold them accountable as they continue growing and maturing in their faith. In verses 4 to 6, the word one appears seven times. We are one body together in one spirit, just as we were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. So a healthy church is also one that recognizes what we hold in common and is grounded on that oneness. But verse 7 reminds me that a healthy church is also one that recognizes its differences. For though we are serving the same one God, though we are one, we are not given the same gifts. Paul writes in verse 7, each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. So a healthy church recognizes and affirms the variety of gifts and roles given to each person. And the church is filled with people who are called to live lives worthy of the calls they have been given doing so with as much humility, gentleness, patience, and love as possible. Some of the traits mentioned when we talked about the fruits of the Spirit that are also highlighted here in verse 2. But whatever we have been called to, however we have been gifted, Paul desires us as he begged the church in Ephesus 
to lead a life worthy of the calling to which they have been called. Now when we get to verses 11 and 12, we see that he mentions a variety of roles in the church related to the gifts God gives. And this is not exhaustive, uh, but Paul says God gave gifts that some would be apostles, some prophets, people who are encouragers, have a word to speak, some who are evangelists, people who spread the good news, who, who reach out and have compassion to others, some pastors and some teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And that last line in verse 12 is an important one because that's the end goal, to build up the body of Christ. And then verse 13, to build up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to this measure of the full stature of Christ. And so we are called, whatever our roles, whatever our gifts, to build up the body of Christ until all of us come to that place of maturity, to a full knowledge of the Son of God, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. So we're building something here at Montville UMC. We are building upon something already present as well. And we're continuing to make it stronger, healthier with every worship service, with every mission outreach, with every year that passes by, desiring it to be healthier, more vital, and growing and maturing in Christ together each and every day. But there is a lot of language of growth, a lot of language of maturity in that verse we just read. And so I, I think a healthy church, a sign of a healthy church is one that's always growing, or at least open to always growing. And as a church, I assume we're a church that wants to be described as healthy, not unhealthy. We don't want to be what Paul is describing in verse 14. For he gives an example of immaturity in contrast to this, this desire to grow in maturity. He says, we don't want to be children tossed to and fro who are blown around by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. And healthy churches, instead of being blown around by all sorts of things, instead of having their focus averted as they mature, as verse 15 says, they will grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promoting the body's growth and building itself up in love. And so not only does a healthy church, as it grows, focus on Christ, its head, but that growth is promoted most of all by building itself up in love. And how do we better do that? How do we better build up the body of Christ in love with each other and also to the world we're called to reach outside the walls of this church? Once again, perfection is not what we're striving for, but wholeness and health. And how can we take this passage, how can we be inspired, as Paul opens saying, how can we be inspired to lead lives worthy of the calling to which God has called us? And I wonder, what is your calling in this season of the church? What's your calling in life? Are you willing to serve where needed, to go where God sends you? What may the Spirit be prompting you toward? Where is the Spirit leading you? Now, as we think about this idea of a healthy church, I think it's helpful to realize what the church is. And the pandemic really gave us an opportunity to see an up-close picture of what that is, because we were not meeting in this sanctuary. We were not gathered together as a worship community, as one in the same place, but in all sorts of places, across our homes and across the towns. But if the church building were not here, what would we have if we didn't have this sanctuary, what would we be? Well, we would still have a church, we would still be the church, because as someone once quoted, if the church burns down and the preacher goes out of town, what you have left is the church. Because the church is not a building, the church is a people, yes? And there's a song in our hymnal that we're gonna sing later that says, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, 
Yes, we are the church together. And then verse 1 says, the church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not merely a resting place, but the church is a people. And you know, there are even aspects of our United Methodist structure that make our church stronger and empower all of you as the laity to be the church all the more, to work as the body of Christ, building up the kingdom of God. One thing I love about this church is there's a really big focus that's put on the laity. And so we have a strong emphasis on this notion of the priesthood of all believers, that it's not just the pastor, but it's all of us who are considered ministers, people who serve God in their various roles and contexts they find themselves in. And so myself as a pastor is not called above, but is called out of the laity to serve in a particular way. But all of Christ's church are servants of God, yes. All of Christ's church is called to serve. And because in the United Methodist world, we have an itinerant system where pastors are called and sent, where no pastor knows for sure how long they will serve a church, and no congregation knows for sure how long they will have a pastor, that fact alone empowers and encourages the lady to take ownership all the more of the church. Because the church is not so much defined by the pastor up here, it is defined by the people who do the work of ministry, who are serving in the community. But friends, as we think about building up the body of Christ, as we reflect on even what gifts that God has maybe given us individually, I want to encourage you to open up your gifts to the building up of the body of Christ so that we can grow all the more into what God is calling us to. We need your gifts, and there are so many ways to serve. We need people to serve in a Sunday school ministry. We need people to serve in hands-on mission, locally and beyond. We need people to help with this new virtual worship reality that we're in, people to help be part of a, a digital uh, online worship team, people to help with our new outreach initiative, Hungry to Whole, as we seek to do what we've spoken, right? To reach out, to make known this love and uh, package it in a way that is receptive and where people can encounter the love of God. We want people who are able to count to be stewards of the money that comes in, people to serve on different committees and be a part of that which helps to move ministry forward, even if it's sometimes the things that are behind the scenes. And so, you know, there's lots more that could be mentioned, but what could God be calling you in this season? How could God be calling you to serve? Especially mindful that we are all that priesthood of believers. We are all servants of God. And friends, although my not-so-perfect sermon has gone longer than 10 minutes, and although I will never be able to live up to the impossible description of the article I read, I pray that you would not strive to be perfect, but that you would strive to be faithful, to live lives worthy of the calling you've received, using your gifts according to the grace God has given you. And although you may be imperfect, I pray that that does not discourage you, but encourages you to turn to the one who is perfect, the one who helps to make us whole. And as long as our focus stays on the one who is perfect, I guarantee you that a lot of these things mentioned in this list that Paul gives of character traits will be ours in increasing abundance until we as healthy disciples, as a healthy church, grow more and more to maturity, grow more and more to the measure and full stature of Christ, building the church up in love, using our gifts, however we're called, as we move in our lives and also in our church from hungry to whole. Amen? Amen. Amen. But I want to invite Amen up now, and I want to invite you to grab your blue hymnal as we sing a song that was mentioned in our sermon today, a song called We Are the Church. And though we love our church building, though we love being in the sanctuary, I hope that you can know and recognize ever and always that the people is what the church is, that we are the body of Christ. And so we invite you to sing this song with conviction, with that uh, passage we read and discussed in mind, and ask you to let this be even a, a prayer of surrender. God, I want to be the church. 
together, one with others, and maybe even a prayer as you're singing this, God, how are you calling me to be the church as you use my gifts for whatever flies ahead in this season of ministry? But we invite you to stand as you join us in our next hymn, We Are the Church, hymn number 515. so that we can know we have a circle of support. We have people who are praying, who can lift us up in our times of need, in the times of need that others in our lives or our community are experiencing. And so we come to this place knowing that our focus is on God, uh, but we do this for the sake of building ourselves up as we strive to let people know of that great love and grace God has. And so what do you want to bring forward today uh, what prayer concerns are there on your hearts? Sharon. <clears throat> Our niece Tracy, her life is, at the moment, is overflowing with things that she needs to deal with. She also lost her mother this week. Um, pray for her for peace and comfort, strength and guidance. So we want to lift up Tracy just in this difficult season, losing a mother and all that she's dealing with, uh, the emotions, the realities around her. Thank you, Sharon. Any other prayer requests? Bob? My uh, daughter, Deborah, is exhibiting some signs of uh, heart problems. And uh, she's doctoring, but it's not been too successful so far, so um, she needs prayer as to what to do, where to go, and what kind of treatment would be best for her. And so we lift up Deborah, Bob's daughter, as we pray for discernment and wisdom as to figure out a solution and healing in the midst of all that's going on. So thank you, Bob. Any other prayer requests? We also want to let you know uh, Linda Brennan continues to ask for prayers of provision. Uh, as you know, she's been in a job transition. Uh, starting today, she's you know got a job that's um, 
helping to bring in a little bit of income, but we ask for continued prayers and provision in terms of finding the right job, the right fit, not just something temporary, but more long term. Um, and then uh, I wanted to also share a prayer, prayer request for my aunt Marlene. Uh, she's over in California, but recently fell and broke her hip. And so she's uh, got a long recovery road ahead of her, uh, but also wanted to lift up Linda and Marlene today. And then I want to encourage you to pray for our church, right? As I know many of you do each and every week so faithfully, uh, praying that we would be a healthy church, that we would have God's vision, that we'd focus on Christ, and that we would help to build each other up, build this community up, as we strive for that maturity in the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. And so I invite you to uh, take one or two of the requests you heard, uh, take the prayer list, put it before you, and I invite you to pray with me as we bring this to God. Let us pray. Lord God, we are grateful for the chance to come to you in prayer because we know we are dependent, God. We are looking into our perfect God for answers, for healing, for help in the midst of all the broken realities around us. God, we've heard expressed today that there is mourning going on. God, there is uncertainty and answers that are needing to be given in the midst of current physical realities. There is provision that's lacking and that we're not sure where it will come from. There is hurting that needs progress and healing and also people on our prayer list who have been suffering, long suffering for quite some time. People who uh, even just need a reminder of your presence and the daily strength to get through to this next season ahead. But God, we lift them up and we ask that you would build them up just as we strive to build them up in our prayers today because we know that you are the one who constructs and makes whole and fills where it's lacking and can take all we've named from hungry to whole. And so God, whether it's someone who's mourning, someone who's seeking answers, seeking provision, seeking help and healing, we pray that you would take them from hungry to whole, whatever that looks like. And God, we pray for the world we live in, the church we are part of, God, we want to, as a church, help to bring more health to the world just through the small things we do that make a perhaps a bigger splash and impact than we can ever imagine in your kingdom. Uh, but God, help us to be a healthy church, to one that is mindful of the pulse of what it is our heart is beating to, that is mindful of the signs of life and vitality that we're striving toward. Um, help us to do that, to be a healthy church, so that others can experience wholeness, so that the world can be a more wholesome place. But God, we know that you hear us, we know that you are faithful to see us through and to see those through who we've named to you today. So come Holy Spirit, have your way, and do only what you can do. And God, we pray all these things, we seal them with that prayer that your Son, our Savior, taught us, as we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, as we prepare to close our service, we want to invite you to turn to hymn number 593 in your blue hymnal. As we sing a, a song that really is a prayer of surrender and an invitation for God to use us as God wills. And so we invite you to sing, Here I Am, Lord, hymn number 593. Here I Am, Lord, in your blue hymnal. I invite you to stand as you're able as we join together.
them. Friends, just as Abraham and his calling early on in the story of Scripture was told, may you be blessed to be a blessing. And may you go into the world today and always growing in maturity, building up the church in love as you serve God wherever Christ leads. Amen? Amen. Amen. Friends, go in love, peace, and wholeness to serve the Lord.